Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining for this Friday afternoon session. Uh, today, we are going to have Stop Kubernetes Revolving Doors uh, and then tutorial to secure a Kubernetes cluster. So my name is Mai. I'm working uh, as a software engineer at Isovalent. Uh, let me introduce Savita. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mahe. My name is Savita Raghunathan. I am a senior software engineer at Red Hat. I also work with Mahe and Ray on the SIG Kubernetes SIG security group, I'm the lead for SIG security documentation project. And now I'll pass it over to Ray. Hey, folks. My name is Ray Lohano. I'm a solutions architect at Red Hat. I'm also uh, one of the uh, co-chairs of Kubernetes SIG Docs. I'm also one of the sub-project leads for SIG Security. So I help run the external security audits uh, for the project. And if you don't know, um, upstream Kubernetes by default is not secure. Guardrails are not in place when you install upstream Kubernetes. So that means pods can really talk to other pods, even on other nodes. Uh, if you could easily traverse across namespaces as well. Uh, if a user has somehow breached a pod or container, they can also be able to access the, the Kube API server and also the, the worker node itself. So here we're, talk, we're here to talk about how to secure Kubernetes. And we did publish the upstream security guide, a checklist on how to do that. Thanks, Ray. Uh, yeah, the security checklist was merged uh, almost two years ago now. You can see in this picture that many people actually participated in its creation. You have a bunch of reviewers, a bunch of authors on the, on the PR, and we had a lot of discussion around this. Like, uh, we created some draft, and then we had like, something like 200 uh, conversation on this uh, PR. So the idea, the goal was to provide the community with like a basic but solid official checklist uh, that is not maybe sufficient, but is ni a nice start for starting your security journey with Kubernetes. And because quite often, um, so it looks like that. Uh, quite often, the question about security in Kubernetes is like where to start. So this checklist gives you uh, a bunch of list of pain points and how to dive deep into like this uh, deep. Uh, pain points and, and learn more details directly in the Kubernetes documentation. All right. Once again, there's a link to this uh, Kubernetes security checklist. Uh, like Mahed said, it is uh, a basic security guidance. Uh, it may not and it is not sufficient for production, but it is a good starting point. Uh, so some of the sections of that security checklist is authentication and authorization. Uh, we're going to go a little bit high level, and we're going to go dive deep in the tutorial. So we want to go into the tutorial uh, pretty quick to get folks started in the workshop. So with the security checklist topics, we have authentication and authorization, like to make sure uh, service accounts are being used by your workloads, making sure the super user group uh, system masters is not used. And if it is used, why? And there might be why, so we have to take a look in the workshop. Uh, make sure the RBAC good practices are actually uh, used. There is an RBAC good practices guide as well. Then we'll go into network security. Uh, make sure to, you can or you are using uh, a CNI plugin that, uh, that can do network policies so we could, so we could secure namespaces uh, as well. Uh, make sure we have default deny all uh, network policies as well. We could control the ingress and egress. Also, we want to make sure we don't expose uh, XE or the API server or the Kubelet API out to the internet. Then we'll go into pod security. Uh, we'll learn how to uh, create RBAC or use RBAC to create uh, to use, uh, like a pod viewer role and to make sure only the, the folks that actually need the create uh, ability or the patch ability, the delete ability, actually have those. Uh, next, we'll go into admission controllers. We'll take a look at the pod security mission controller and take a look at pod security standards as well, which replace pod security policy. Uh, we, we won't go through all of the sections through today's tutorial. We won't, we won't go through logs and auditing. Uh, but if you do have uh, audit logs enabled to make sure that they are protected from general access. We will do pod placements, so we'll take a look on how to uh, place pods uh, securely into, uh, or to isolate, uh, to, to isolate your highly sensitive applications. Uh, running on nodes. We'll also take a look on how to place pods on specific nodes as well. Uh, we won't go into secrets too much because well, we're not going to do an external secret store, and we won't go through uh, images like, like scanning for scanning your images. 
So for this tutorial, we are going to use Kind. Um, we have developed in such a way that it can run in your local machine. Um, so you can try it out later if you want to go home and you know have a refresher. You want to pass it on to your friends. You can. We have the repo shared in the um, little paper that we have put there, and we will also upload the slides. Um, the prerequisites for this is Docker, and a kind is essentially Kubernetes and Docker, so each node runs as a Docker container, and we have provisioned the kind cluster with Celium. Celium is going to help us do the network policies, and um, Kind is also a Kubernetes project, and it is used for local development and integration testing and everything. It's a really cool project. If you want to test new features, it's always up to date. So I think whenever there is a Kubernetes release is made the next day, or immediately the updated version of Kind is available. So it's cool. Um, we are also going to use Instrict um, as our platform. This is a browser-based browser platform which lets you do copy paste or click and run so that uh, to provide a really good um, experience for you all today. Gonna go on here and we are gonna pause here for a few minutes so please um, feel free to log on. Uh, and if you have any questions or anything, please let us know. All right. So there's going to be eight modules. We'll give some folks some time to log in. Uh, there are sheets uh, with the same login or the same short uh, URL link and with the QR code as well. So please feel free to log in as well. So we're going to try to go through slowly uh, the steps as well. Uh, but you can go on your own pace. Uh, there are eight modules, like I mentioned. Uh, so I will go through, hopefully I'll, I can enlarge this. I'm just going to start, uh, wait a few more minutes to get, uh, to wait for folks to. OK, got it. And does anyone need a copy of the access? Let me put it, go back to that slide for now. All right, sounds good. Looks like we have a fair amount of people logged in. Um, so we'll start. And like I mentioned, I'm gonna try, we're going to try to go through this slowly uh, and explain some of the concepts as well. And there are some loading times as well. <laughs> so I'm going to go to start. You have your terminal on the left. Let's see how it looks. OK, I'm on the screen. And you have instructions on the right. Uh, so the format is there are some concept explanation uh, what each module is going to cover in terms of, this, of the security checklist uh, and also some steps. And there is a click to run functionality as well. Uh, there are some modules that does have checks, so you do have to make sure that you do uh, all the steps uh, in that module. So the first one is authentication and authorization uh, about the system master's group. So uh, one uh, such default group is the system masters. And uh, the security checklist says make sure that we're not using system masters uh, for any user or uh, any group uh, for, uh, for authentication after bootstrapping. And to also make sure the uh, role-based access control good practices are followed for guidance. Uh, so in that same RBAC good practice guide, uh, we have a concept of granting least privilege. So we want to make sure that there is minimal RBAC rights given, and there is a module on how to create those minimal RBAC rights. So if you don't know, the System Masters Group is a hard-coded group, and uh, it actually bypasses all, uh, all authorization checks. So it gives uh, someone who is using in, or in the System Masters Groups uh, super user rights uh, in the Kubernetes cluster. So you are a cluster admin. A little bit more into uh, some concepts on how Kubernetes does uh, roles and uh, role bindings. Uh, so uh, Kubernetes uh, does use uh, RBAC by default. Um, so we, uh, with RBAC, there are uh, four types of Kubernetes objects. Uh, two are namespace, two are not namespace. Uh, so uh, roles and cluster roles is where we actually define the set of permissions. Uh, and the permissions are added. There is no deny roles to them. Uh, roles are namespace, cluster roles are not namespace. 
and to actually grant a user uh, or a group those defined roles in a, in a role or a cluster role, uh, we use a um, binding. So they could be a role binding, which is namespace, or a cluster role binding. So with cluster role binding or, or role binding is what we will use to grant permission defined in those roles or cluster roles to users, groups, or service accounts. And a role binding, uh, we're gonna go through some of the concepts here, is used to grant uh, the pod reader role to user if we do create a, a role called pod reader for like get, watch, and list, and then we could apply that, bind it with a role binding. So back to the security checklist, we're gonna to check to see if the system master's group uh, is actually being used, and we'll verify it uh, with if any cluster role bindings or role bindings grant those permissions to a group. So first one is indirect, to inspect the cluster role bindings and, and role bindings. So we're going to uh, take a look to see what the cluster role bindings are actually created in the cluster with key control get cluster role bindings. And these are cluster, these are cluster wide. So we see a very uh, long list here of cluster role bindings. I'm not gonna go through all of it. So there is a long list here of cluster role bindings. So we're gonna try to find uh, better ways on how to actually find to see uh, if, the, uh, if uh, the system master's group is being used. So we're gonna check the description of one of these cluster role bindings, the system public, public info viewer. And we see here uh, the expected outputs here on the left here. We do keep control describe on that cluster role binding uh, system public info viewer. So we can see the name, we see the, the role that it's binding, and we see the name of that role as well. And so as we see the subjects here, we have the system uh, uh, authenticated and system unauthenticated. So with this, we see the cluster role binding here binds the permissions uh, that are set in the system public info viewer uh, to two groups that system authenticated and system unauthenticated. And both the system authenticated and system unauthenticated are built-in groups. So we're gonna now check the manifest of the same cluster role binding here of the public info viewer. And we got a big uh, YAML file here. Uh, we could also same, get the same manifest in JSON as well. So with uh, the ability to use JSON, we could use a command line uh, JSON processor called JQ to use to parse and to search for any cluster role bindings and role bindings that bind that system masters group. So we're gonna try to find a way to retrieve that easily. So first, let's get all cluster role bindings in JSON. So this is all the cluster role bindings in JSON. So it's a lot to go through. We're not gonna go through all of it, of course, but it's a little bit much to, uh, to go through all of them. So the way we're gonna actually find to see if the cluster role binding binds the system master groups, uh, we're gonna use grep. It's simple to use, so we're gonna do the same thing, uh, get the cluster, all cluster role bindings, the outputs to JSON, and just grep for system masters to see if it's actually being used. And we see it actually being used. So do we expect that? Maybe, so we'll take a look and see uh, what, is, what role or what group is using the system masters. So to verify uh, if this output is correct, uh, or to get more info, we're gonna use the before context with grep. And we get some uh, nice JSON here. So now we can see that the cluster admin, cluster role binding, binds the cluster admin, cluster role to the system masters group. And, uh, and the cluster admin uh, is a default, uh, one of the default cluster roles, and it is supposed to use the system masters group. So it's typically used uh, during the bootstrapping process. So we're gonna check to see if uh, there are cluster role bindings or role bindings uh, that bind to the system master groups with using JQ. So here we're gonna J use JQ, get all the cluster role bindings again, and JSON, 
Uh, we're going to use jqt to iterate over the items. And we're going to use the select function in jq to, uh, to find if, the group, if there is a group that equals system masters. So we do have an output, of course. We have the cluster admin uh, that we expect. Uh, so there is an error as well, which we, uh, we cannot iterate over null. Uh, and we get that error because uh, there are cluster role bindings that do not have subjects. Uh, so we could actually fix that. If you want to make it more cleaner, we could add a question mark uh, to any of the, the close bracket, open and close brackets uh, so we could uh, we, to not output that error. Now we have a clean output that we can use for further iteration. So now we, could, now we know how to parse using JQ. Now we could uh, take a look with using cube control and using custom columns and using subshell, we could make a nice pretty output of custom columns to see if there are any cluster role bindings that uh, use and then bind system masters. And we could take a look at that. And we do have the cluster role binding as we expect uh, with cluster admin, uh, which binds the cluster admin cluster role to the system masters. So now it's easy to use, uh, we have easy to read columns so we could, we could use further on. Now we could also take a look to see for the cluster, uh, for, for cluster bro bindings as well, and we could use the same, we could use JQ to iterate. And we do expect the cluster admin, which we do expect. Now we could also use the subshell with that same query to output the names of the cluster role bindings that have the system masters group in the, sub, in the subject uh, to the cube control command that outputs to the custom columns. And we have a command that outputs the cluster role bindings with the system masters groups in the subject and also outputs the name of the cluster role bindings in the cluster role. And we could also add uh, in any subjects, possible subjects, and also any labels. So here we do have the nice outputs of the cluster role, cluster role binding with the subject system masters, any possible labels as well that actually uh, tell us that's actually used for bootstrapping and it's part of the RBAC defaults. Now we have a cluster role binding, but there might be a role binding that actually uses system masters. So let's use that same query to see if we have any role bindings that might uh, use system masters, which should, should not and we do not. So we have that as our expected output. Uh, just to summarize, so System Masters is a special super user group that is uh, used for bootstrapping and should not uh, be used by any cluster role binding or any role binding outside of the default. And to check it, uh, we have we used JQ to iterate uh, over all the cluster role bindings and also all the role bindings as well. All right, so I'm gonna, it's gonna take a few seconds for the next module to load up, so we'll give some time. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, thank you, Ray. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask, like, does anybody uh, have an issue joining the workshop? Is no, it me? Is a question. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, uh, do an OPA policy um, as your external admission controller as well, so you can prevent uh, any cluster role bindings, role bindings to use system masters. And that's probably very advisable to do. So, yeah. I assume that this works for everyone in the room, yeah? Nobody has an issue joining the thing? I just want to make a note it's not just OPA, you can use Cuboard and Kyberno other admission okay. controllers as well. So. well. All right then, let's move on to the next one. So here we're gonna see about applying network policies and it is from the network security section of the checklist. So we're gonna see how to apply ingress and egress network policies and default network policies within each namespace, selecting all pods, denying everything or in place. Um, 
to give a little bit of background, given the distributed nature of Kubernetes, networking is a critical component. There is container to container communication, part to part communication, part to service, service to external, and vice versa. So there is a lot of networking to deal with. Um, in this section, we're gonna see how to apply network policies on part to part communications. So in a Typical cluster, there could be n number of namespaces, and each namespace can pertain to a team or a critical workload. And we would want to ensure that they stay safe. If something is going to expose uh, PII information, we want to make sure only the authenticator, only the allowed pods can reach out to this one um, where we can get that information. That is the use of network policies, and it can go beyond that. Uh, in this, we are just going to see very simple how to apply it between two pods running in a source namespace and a target namespace. We're going to create two namespaces first, and we are going to create two Nginx pods. And then we are going to create a service for each of those pods so that they can be accessible. And then we're going to see if we can reach out from one pod to the another. So let's get started. Here, I'm going to first create a source namespace and then a target namespace. And I'm also going to create a um, pod that runs Nginx 1.27 image. It's a very simple web server pod. And I'm going to create another one in the target namespace, running, uh, which is going to run the same um, image. And now that we have all the pods running, let's just verify it. Yes, we have the pods running in the source namespace. Same goes to the target namespace. And uh, let's create services on each of the namespace so that these pods can be accessible. So when we create a service, it's going to create a, a good um, friendly DNS um, URL for us, which uses the cluster DNS that can be accessed in general, the format, the pod name, the um, uh, namespace, and dot .svc. Dot, mm, there, there is a format for it, I think, dot cluster dot local. And um, let me see if I did the target. Let me just do the source as well. Yes, we have two of the services created. I'm going to see if up. All right, okay, so this is the format that we have um, service.namespace.svc.cluster.local. And now that we have these two up and running, let's see if we could um, reach from the Nginx pod that's running in the source namespace to the one that's running in the target namespace. We are just going to use kubectl exec and then just do a simple call. So yes, it can reach. There is no network policies in place, and every part can reach out to every other part using services. Now let's get started by applying a simple network policy in the target namespace. What we're going to do is we are going to um, deny all traffic ingress and egress. Ingress is any traffic that comes into the pod from external entities, and then egress is any, top, any traffic that goes out of the pod to external entities. So we're going to deny all of them, so none of the pods should be able to reach out to any pods running in the target namespace. Let's create this network policy. Once we have that, we are going to run the same command that we ran before. We're going to try and reach out to this pod in the target namespace from the one in the source namespace. So you have a timeout of 10 seconds, and you should not be able to reach to that. Yes, the connection timed out, and we shouldn't be able to reach out. That is because we already have a policy in place. What we're going to do is now we are going to create another policy to just allow ingress from the source um, namespace to the target namespace. 
Here you can see we are creating a policy in target namespace, and then the type is ingress, and then we are um, adding a namespace selector, saying that anything from the source namespace, any part from the known source namespace should be able to reach out to the ones and the target namespace. Let's go ahead and create this. And see that the policy is created. And let's now do the same test. And yeah, so now we are able to reach out because the policies are in place. Um, that's great. Let's just test this by creating a new namespace called new source. And we will re-repeat the same process we did, create a pod, expose the pod using a service so that it's accessible. And from that pod, we will try and reach out to the target namespace just to verify if you are able to reach out uh, to anything in target namespace since we have two network policies there. Just created that. And I think the pod is ready. Going to just put and see. Yeah, so this confirms that we are able to apply the network policies. The network policies that we applied are working as intended. So if we just redo the test again from our source to the target, uh, the pods from the source namespace to the one in the target namespace, we should be able to access the data. So now we have a two policies, a default deny inverse and egress from the target namespace. So any of the traffic that is going out of the target namespace to any of the namespace should not work because we already have, uh, we are blocking the egress. Let's just confirm that. So in this we are reaching from the pod in the target namespace to the pod in the source namespace. So we see that this errors out and now Let's go ahead and create the policy that we did before, but this time we are gonna say it's an egress type and we will select the source namespace. So once we have this policy, technically we should be able to reach out to the part in the source namespace. Let's go and repeat our test. So we are again reaching from the tar part in the target namespace to the one in the source namespace. It's taking a while, it shouldn't take a while. It should be able to, we should be able to access. We have all the policies in place. So let's try and um, do, take a step back and think why this might be happening. This could be because it's not able to dissolve the DNS um, records. Let's test our theory by getting the IP of the part in the source namespace, and we will use that IP to reach out to from the part in the target namespace. So we are able to do it, so it is definitely DNS, like always. Uh, the reason why it is not working here is that all the core components of the Kubernetes get, de gets deployed in the kube system. That's where whatever the DNS um, service that you're using, like by default it comes with core DNS. You can have your own uh, other softwares that you can use. Um, and since we don't have any ingress or egress that is, uh, going out uh, from the target namespace to the cube system, we are not able to access the DNS records. So the, if you try this out in your kind local cluster, you might also see another error saying that could not resolve the host. But in this platform, we are getting the timed out error. So in case if you're trying it out on your own and if you see that error, that is also a valid error that it is much more state forward. So here we are gonna create a network policy that's gonna allow ingress and egress from the target namespace to the kube system. So 
let's go ahead and create that one. Once it's created, now we can go ahead and test um, again that if we are able to reach out to the source namespace part from the target namespace part. So yes, we are. So in this little exercise that we learned how to apply basic network policies, and we have also seen um, how the networking works, that in order to resolve a DNS, it needs to have access to the cube system. Um, so that is a little something. And after this, it's going to be pod security. Yeah. So yeah, pod security. So the idea behind pod security is to restrict like the most sensitive fields uh, that pod can use, and like that could decrease the security posture of your cluster, um, and also like to enforce the best uh, security, uh, the best practice on on the pods. So you may be familiar with the pod security policies. Uh, it was actually the admission controller that, that was removed in uh, Kubernetes 125. Let me just do that. Skip this one. All right. Um, it mostly was removed because uh, it was very infamous for being very uh, hard to use and very challenging. So it was replaced actually by two things. So there is now this thing called pod security standards. Um, you can see about that here. Uh, there are like three uh, security standards, privileged, baseline, and restricted. So these things are actually very generic. You can implement that with any uh, admission controllers. Those are just like specification on which field should be allowed or which field should be used on a specific uh, pod. Um, the good thing is that the Kubernetes organization also implemented an admission controller on themselves, which is called the pod uh, security admission. That is really easy to use. Basically, you can just like label uh, your namespace to uh, do three different things. Oh, sorry for the noise. All right. Um, you can use it in enforcement, so uh, every violation will be rejected in audit mode just to see like what would happen, and in ward mode, uh, so that users receive a warning directly. So we'll go to this uh, in this challenge. Oh, sorry. All right, so first we'll use the baseline policy in one mode. So you can see uh, the baseline thing, like uh, host namespaced are disallowed, privileged container are disallowed. This is the basic stuff. Like um, many of the specification have like this baseline security configuration. So uh, yeah, let, let's do it. So we, we'll first con uh, do it with one mode. So first thing, we create a namespace called secure namespace, right? And then what we do is we actually label that namespace, the secure namespace, with podsecurity.kubernetes.io with one equal baseline. It's labeled. And now, if we want to create a pod that actually uh, um, violate that baseline policy, so this one will just try to create a, priv a privileged pod. Um, what will happen is that the pod should be created, but like the user will receive a warning. Um, like that this pod will violate like the pod security baseline latest uh, because of like the security concerns that privilege equal true. So this is really nice for your uh, cluster users to have like some uh, actual feedback on what they do before applying the policy for real. Um, again, we can see that the pod is created and that it worked. So let's delete that pod now. All right. So now, uh, for enforcement, is as simple as the previous one. We just like override the label with the enforce uh, equal baseline label. So the namespace is labeled. And now, if we create exactly the same pod with exactly the same security context with privilege equal true, what happens is that it gets rejected. So this is like the same thing as before, but then like any violation actually rejects the action. So you can see it's forbidden, and if we, if we check the pod running in the namespace, we don't find any resources. Great. 
So now, if we create a pod that satisfies actually the baseline policy by setting privilege mode uh, to false explicitly, and we create the pod, the pod is created. Again, we can verify it's running, and then delete the pod. All right, so now we can move on to like restricted. Uh, restricted will be uh, more restricted, as the name say. And uh, as usual, it's the same. You just like use one equal restricted and override the label on the namespace. We can even like see the label on the namespace. Uh, all right, you can see enforce equal baseline and one equal restricted. So in this mode, basically, you enforce like the basic stuff, but you can warn your users on like what it would be if we switch eventually to the restricted mode. So now if we create that same pod with the privilege container equal false. Uh, we could see that the pod was created, but it would violate the restricted uh, uh, standards, restricted profile. You can check that the pod is running again and delete the pod. All right. Uh, no, there is one other thing. Uh, it's called dry run. Um, because most of the time, what happens is that when you uh, label a namespace, you already have like a few pods running in that namespace. So what we will do here is that we will dry run on the server side, so on the Kubernetes API side, and overwrite um, the label with like enforce restricted to see what will happen. And so if we do that, we can see that like existing pods will actually violate that, uh, uh, that uh, restrict, uh, sorry, some pods in the namespace would actually violate this uh, enforcement. So workload will be affected. So conclusion, like um, I think the pod security standards define uh, like very easy to use policies uh, for uh, like deploying pods. Uh, the pod security admission make it very easy to actually apply that to any namespace just by labeling a namespace. So yeah, that is, that is pretty handy. And you could actually use these standards with different admission controllers like uh, Kiverno, OPA, and things like that. Those are implemented by the pod security admission, but yeah. Did you have a question? I, no, okay, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, we're good. Anybody has a question, maybe? So I guess we can move on to the next one. Let's check. So the next one is SecComp. So I will try to do a bit of explanation before, uh, before starting. So yeah, pods are containers. Containers are regular processes on the Linux. We are just using a lot of mechanism to restrict the view of the system and uh, their access to the resources. And system calls are the main interface between the processes and the operating system. So they are used to perform like all the basic actions like uh, opening a file, creating a network socket, mounting a file system, creating a new process, et cetera, et cetera. Um, containers already restrict this, uh, the access to the OS5 system by uh, restricting uh, the resources, like uh, CPU memory, by using actually like C groups. Uh, they are restricting the view of um, the OS by using namespaces, and uh, some system calls are already like uh, uh, restricted, right? But, um, as you may know, like, because system calls are the interface between these processes and the operating system, uh, it, it, it might happen that they have like, a bug. And because like, the operating system actually controls the hardware, like, uh, if those are subject to bugs, it can be eventually exploited for abuse. So a, a very good idea is to actually try to restrict which system calls uh, the process in our Kubernetes pods uh, containers can call. Um, to restrict the potential attack surface. So how we can do that? Um, 
a mechanism to, to do that is called SecComp. It's pretty old in the Linux kernel, and it has like two modes. Uh, there is like the strict modes, which is very restrictive. You can only uh, access like the read, write, and exit uh, system call. So you can't really do much with like uh, a workload with that, but there is the filter mode. Uh, the filter mode permits to use something called CBPF, so classic BPF, not to be confused with eBPF, extended BPF, right? So this is just like very simple filters to allow arbitrary uh, system calls. So it, it is often referred as second BPF. Um, my colleague Duffy and Natalia just gave a talk, I think, just before uh, about like the difference between second and eBPF. But yeah, and and the thing is that like writing your own filters might be tricky because you need to know the syscalls, you need to know like which syscalls are the most sensitive. Uh, all the details about these syscalls and everything. So the very good thing is that the container runtimes, uh, Docker started that, but now like on, on container D, cryo, you, you can find um, like runtime uh, defaults. So those are like a most more restricted uh, filter that you can apply for all your workloads and that is already installed uh, on each node and that you can use directly. So what are the syscalls they restrict in this set? So uh, most, like, some of the calls are like obsolete syscalls that nobody uses anyway, but are yeah, just for compatibility, so we just like, restrict them because we don't really need them. Some of them are like uh, non-namespaced resource on all kernels, like the date, time, or carrying, like the kernel carrying. Uh, it's changed on recent kernels, but like, on all kernels, it's still like, non-namespaced, so it kind of breaks like, the isolation given by containers. And, uh, the rest of the calls are actually mostly like highly privileged operations. Like uh, uh, most of them are already guarded by capabilities like mounting, creating a new namespace, like loading a kernel module, loading like a BPF program, these kind of things. So this can be useful for certain workloads, but most of your workloads will not use that. So a good idea is to use this default profile to um, reduce this uh, surface. So let's do that. So here you have a bit of explanation. Uh, in SecCom BPF, you have a few modes. Uh, you can use act allow and act know, to specify like uh, what syscalls are allowed or what like syscalls are explicitly denied, uh, depending on how you want to write your filters. Uh, yeah, runtime default. So this is basically what I explained. Those are implemented by the container runtimes because they, they usually need um, to access some of the syscall during the creation of the containers. So those are specific to the, the runtime. So how to do that? It's actually pretty simple. So here we just like create a new namespace as usual. And we will do two things. We will deploy like a normal pod without any restricted SecCom profile. This is just like a normal one. Right. And we will deploy another one that has like a security context uh, enforcing like this SecCom profile, the runtime default. So if we do that, it was created as well. We can check that. They are both running. And what you can see if you describe the pod with the SecCom profile, we should be able to see that. Uh, Uh, where it should be somewhere here. Second profile runtime default. So let's try first into the one that is not using the runtime default. So if you check, uh, we can kubectl exec into that pod uh, with like a shell. We run id. We are running as root, and we can use like the unshared binary that will use the unshared system call that is actually restricted by the runtime default. Second profile. So if we run it, you see that the shell uh, changed. Uh, it actually worked. We went from like ID root to uh, ID nobody, which is like uh, 65, uh, 500, 40, uh, 34, sorry. So it was successfully executed. And if we want to exit, you need to exit twice. You need to like go out of the shell inside the user namespace and go out uh, from the kubectl pods. So now what will happen if we do the same <coughs> into the one that has like the second uh, profile that is runtime default? Immediately, if we just like try to unshare user, we end up with like operation not, not permitted. So like the, the good thing is that second just like uh, overrided like the return value of that syscall and return minus one in this case. 
So yeah, you can read more about like the unshare user command. Um, this is just an example. Uh, it's actually restricting a lot of other syscalls. Like I said, like for example, like reboot, loading, BPF program, and things like that. So in conclusion, by following this step, you can use like this runtime default that is always like that. It's basically effortless. You just need to add like this little field in your Kubernetes deployment, and uh, it will actually reduce quite well the attack surface. So in case of like vulnerability in the future on some syscalls, if you block them, you are basically pretty safe. Here we are. So does anybody have a question on that? Maybe Ray, you want to join. All right. All right. <clears throat> Next, we'll go over some R back. So, as part of the uh, security good practice guide to uh, the, use the concept of least privilege. So make sure that uh, you're not freely using create, update, patch, delete, or you're not granting those rights uh, to uh, just anyone. So you just want to make sure you want to limit access uh, of create, update, patch, delete. So we're actually not going to use those. We're going to create a viewer role, and we're going to go through the steps on how to create a pod viewer role. So we'll use both uh, all four roles, uh, cluster roles, role bindings, and cluster role bindings on how to do that. So we're going to create a new namespace because we're going to create a, a, cluster, a role binding that's actually be namespace. So let's create a new namespace, the RBAC namespace. So once the namespace is created, uh, just a review, roles are namespace, cluster roles are cluster wide, but you could actually use uh, role bindings for cluster roles, even though you don't have to use cluster role bindings for cluster roles. So we're going to define a set of permissions in our cluster role, and it's going to be a, we're going to call it the pod viewer role, and we're going to give it uh, the rights to get, watch, and list. And once we actually create it and use it, we're going to test to make sure it could only do get, watch, and list as well. So once the uh, pod viewer role or cluster role is created, that means this role is available cluster wide, we'll use a role binding, now it's namespaced, to bind that pod viewer cluster role to a user just called devconf in the pod view group. So we're going to use uh, do a role binding uh, for that. We're going to call it view pods as well in that same namespace. We're going to use a user. We're going to use a, a group as well called pod view. And we're going to use that cluster role that we just created called pod viewer. And we're going to test this out. So we created that role binding. So now it's namespace, that namespace. And we're going to test it out. We're going to do kube control. And you can do the dash dash as command for a user or do the dash dash as dash group uh, option as well for to use, it, to use a group. So we can test out uh, our back here. So we're going to use the pod view group and the devconf user. Uh, try to do a get pods on the same namespace. So we should, we should be able to do this. And we, and we can't. We don't have any running pods right now. So we're going to do this uh, different test. We're going to use the same group, uh, same user, but on a different namespace, the cube system namespace. We're going to try to use, uh, do a get pods with the pod view uh, group and devconf user uh, on the cube system namespace. So we expect this not to work. And it is not working. So we get an error uh, forbidden. So now let's go check to see the same, do the similar same test if we could get pods in the default namespace. So we're going to use a, the pod view group, use uh, the devconf user, and see if we get pods on the default namespace. And we don't. Because we use that, uh, that role binding, which is namespace, even though we use that cluster role, uh, which is uh, cluster wide, it is still uh, restricted to that specific namespace. So let's make sure that this user cannot actually create a pod. Remember, this is a pod viewer user. Uh, so this, this user should only be able to, uh, to, to watch and get and list pods, so should not be able to create a pod. So we will use the kubectl run command 
do that will immediately. It's the imperative command to create a pod. So keep control run, uh, the name of the pod and the image and with the namespace and with the options, the dash dash as as a user, the def conf user, dash dash as dash group, the pod view group. So we should actually, we should expect this to not to run. And we actually get the error that it is forbidden. This is weak, it actually tells you the user cannot create the resource pods in this namespace. So great, it's working. So let's create a creator role. Let's say so someone actually does need to create a pod. So now let's create a role. Now this is the namespace, the pod creator role. Uh, we give it, this is for both pods and deployments. So, uh, and we give it uh, the get what list watch, create and update uh, permissions. So let's create this uh, role, which is namespace to the RBAC namespace. So once that uh, role is created, uh, like, you know, just to review, this role is actually doesn't actually work unless we have some kind of binding, a role binding or cluster role binding. Uh, so we're gonna do the create the role binding that binds a pod creator role to the, the same uh, user, uh, but to a different group. So once that role binding, uh, so let's uh, test this as well. So let's create a pod now in this namespace. We're using the same user, but as, as a different group. And this is just restricted to users and groups. It could also be applied to service accounts, which we'll go over uh, last, or next module. So this pod is created. Now we have uh, the ability to create a pod in this namespace. And just some quick uh, helpful commands as well. Uh, cube control auth can I, it's one of my favorite commands. Uh, it tells you explicitly if you can't actually do certain things like cube control auth can I get pods in a specific namespace as a user, as a group, um, and we'll take a look. And it's simple, yes or no. So I can actually get pods as this user, devconf, as a group, pod view. Now we'll see if we could actually delete pods in this namespace uh, using that same user, using that same group, using keep control of can I delete pods in this namespace, and we have an explicit no. So yes, you could iterate through all of the different uh, commands with keep control, with keep control of can I, but you could actually list it out. So, uh, so keep control of can I list, dash dash list, we could actually list out what we can or can't do. So it's one of my favorite commands to use to see if, and if, my, if the user in question uh, can or cannot uh, do a certain task. To summarize, uh, make sure to use the principle of least privilege as, uh, uh, throughout your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, make sure to not uh, to explicitly only you, uh, create roles and cluster roles with the create and uh, update and delete. Um, commands or writes uh, only for specific groups or users or service accounts that actually can do those actions. All right, next one is gonna be pretty quick. It's about uh, service accounts. Uh, I'll just go through the concepts of the service accounts. And so we wanna use service accounts. So uh, service accounts are used to provide identity for your workloads. So your workloads have identity in a the cluster. They can actually do certain actions. So they could uh, reach the, the Kubernetes API server uh, and they might be able to need to, to do certain actions. So they might, so uh, think of it as since Kubernetes is, uh, we use Kubernetes with many, many microservices that have to talk to each other. So, uh, so certain app microservices need certain information from let's say the Kube API server or from uh, other uh, pods in certain namespaces or other microservices. So we could give the same or similar um, rights to, this, to the service accounts. Uh, service accounts, so it should be used. And so in this uh, scenario or this uh, checklist, security checklist item is to make sure that your Kube controller manager is running with the use service account credentials enabled. So this is a fairly fast, uh, simple module just to make sure that service accounts are actually used by default and uh, taking a look to see if a service account is being used. So uh, let's say for, since we do have a cluster up and running already, uh, let's take a look at where the Kube controller uh, manager is and how we can actually take a look. Uh, if you're using Kube ADM, uh, to, uh, to install your Kubernetes cluster, 
it would normally be in a file called slash Etsy slash Kubernetes slash kubecontrollermanager.yaml in your control plane node. Uh, in a kind cluster and in many other distributions of Kubernetes, you may not have access to, the, to that YAML file. Uh, so we need to explore uh, through the Cube Controller Manager pod. So this lab or this module goes through on how to check and how to explore through that Cube Controller Manager pod and just to verify that service counts are being used. So the Cube Controller pod should live in the Cube System namespace. So we'll uh, do Cube Control uh, get pod in that Cube System namespace for that Cube Controller uh, Manager pod. And in this case, we're using kind. It's named a little bit different. And it is running. We have one pod running. Now, like I mentioned, other distributions, this pod can be called something else. So it's typically, uh, uh, it's typically something with Cube Controller Manager. But uh, this is, we do have a query here using uh, JQ. Uh, we could do keep control, get pods, and we could pipe it to JQ uh, to actually take a look to see if there is any pod with the name uh, controller manager. It might have a different uh, prefix or suffix, but this, this is a quick one-liner just to like, take a look to see if, if there is any pods uh, with the controller manager. And yes, we do. And it's called controller manager kind dash control dash plane. So now we should check what options are set um, with the Cube Controller Manager. And uh, a lot of this exercise as well is also can be helpful to use uh, if you have any feature gates you want to use or see if any feature gates are uh, actually enabled or not enabled. We would go through the same steps but with the Cube API server pod as well. Uh, since you may not have access to the YAML manifest of the Cube API server pod, uh, you need to inspect that Cube API server pod, just like how we're inspecting the Cube Controller Manager pod. So we're going to take a look uh, in this Cube Controller Manager pod just to see what options are set uh, in the Cube Controller Manager pod. So we're going to uh, up, output uh, this into YAML. Uh, it's great. We could. It's a lot of. It's a lot of YAML to digest, uh, and we could. We parse this manually, of course, to look through all the options. Uh, and we see options here. And of course, we're going to go through an easier way or another. Uh, uh, um, I like making these fun queries one-liners to make it easy to actually t uh, to, to look for this option. So Cube Controller Manager is the command. And we have many options that are used uh, in, uh, for this Cube Controller Manager. And this keep controller manager, we could just parse it, check to see if the dash dash use service accounts credentials, and it is uh, set to true. So that's great. We're using service accounts, uh, so we do satisfy that security checklist item. And like I said, we have a, a quick one-liner uh, to just to check to see what, what those options are uh, in the command keep controller manager, the container it's in, uh, also the options, so we could parse for uh, this use service accounts uh, right here. Credentials is true. So let's to actually check to make sure of, uh, how service counts are actually, if it's being used uh, as well. So let's create a, a namespace uh, called service-accounts. So there's a brand new namespace. We haven't done anything to it. We're going to uh, get a service account. Like I mentioned, we just created this service account. Is there a, service, a default service account? Yes, there is. We, it was created nine seconds ago when we created this namespace. So let's see if we actually run a pod in this namespace. Uh, let's run an Nginx pod here. We'll do the imperative command. Uh, we're just implying just the namespace, not anything else. And we could retrieve the pod info. And of course, there's a lot of YAML here. But if you take a look to see, uh, we could actually take a look to see there is a, a field here for service accounts. So it's in .spec, .containers, and .service accounts. That's our conditions. Dot spec, dot containers, and service counts. Where is that? No, it's here at default. And you could actually set this to any service account that you create. If you don't set it uh, a service count, it will use that default service count. So it's best to actually create service counts in advance with the right permissions, uh, as you did with the roles and role bindings and cluster roles or cluster role bindings, and use those service accounts to make sure that the application that you're using has the right permissions uh, to do whatever it's necessary for that application. 
And so just to summarize, uh, there is a default uh, service account uh, that is used by pods if you don't spe specify, and we could actually access the Kubernetes API with that default service account as well. Uh, if you need any other permissions, uh, you would need to create a, a new uh, service account for that pod, or if you want to restrict permissions, which is even better, uh, you, you would want to create a service account. So most folks would actually create a service account to restrict permissions and only grant uh, the permission they want for that workload. All right, that's it for this module. Any questions? All right, the next thing that we're going to see is about certificate expiration. This is an educational uh, section. Um, in this, it says, the checklist says, the intermediate and the leave certificates have an expiry date of no more than three years in the future. So if you have used Kubeadium or Kind to provision your cluster, you get the leave of the intermediate certificates issued for about an year. And if you look at the CA certs, on the other hand, they are issued for a default of 10 years. The main reason is it's really, um, uh, hard to rotate those certificates, so they are issued for 10 years. And uh, whenever a cluster is updated using Q QBA ADM, it automatically rotates the certificates for you. And if you have used some managed service, managed uh, Kubernetes providers, the certificates, the, main, the CA certificates could be there for like, the validity would be for like 30 years or so, but at least the intermediate and leave certificates, the validity would always be one year. Um, so let's go ahead and check in this um, section, you're gonna see where the certificates are stored and how we can check the validity. So generally, the, when, whenever a cluster is provisioned using QBADM2, the certificates stored in Etsy Kubernetes PKI, and uh, the used certificates would be in Etsy Kubernetes. And um, in this section, um, the, the QBADM has a nice little utility built into it. You can just check QBADM, so it's check expiration. It's gonna spit out uh, list of certificates at the expiration de uh, date printed next to it. But since our uh, environment is provisioned using kind, we are going to see how we can, um, we can list the certificates available in our control plane and how we can uh, check the validity. First, we're gonna see the nodes um, that are running, and we have like two worker nodes in one control plane. Control plane is the one that's gonna have the certificate stored. And we're gonna, um, the, the, the ones, the API, so the server, the client certificate stored. So we're gonna go look into it more. It will also have the etcd certificate stored. And um, since these are deployed, the nodes are deployed as Docker containers, let's just check what is running here. So you can see there is a control plane here, a kind worker, and um, another kind worker. So let's just do this much more cleaner. Um, so you can see like three or oh, three containers correspond to the three nodes in the client cluster for us. So we're gonna exit into the control plane and then we are going to just list this directory to see what are the certificates available. And you can see like there is this API server cert, API server key, and then there's gonna be like a CA cert, CA key, and so on. The etcd cert's gonna be stored in this etcd directory right here. We will get to it um, in a while. So here, um, so you can see the each certificate has um, its own purpose. The API server, etcd client is used to authenticate to etcd and so on. And let's just exit into the part and we're gonna fetch the API server, etcd client cert, and just gonna cat it out. So you can see a bunch of things printed here, um, cert data but we don't get to see the validity from here. So for that, we're gonna use an um, open SSL tool, and we are just going to uh, list the start and um, 
we're going to make it list the start and end date for us. And there are like three options um, for it, not before, not after. And then like the start date, end date, and the, um, let me just quickly see, start date, end date, and the no out option. No out is just not going to print the certificate for us. So if we go ahead and do that here, you can just see um, that there is the certificate that just got issued when we started this lab today. And this one expires right in like one year. So it is as a validity of one year. So if you go and check um, the certificates, you would be able to see um, all of them will have a validity of one year. Let's go and check the one for the API server kubelet client cert. Um, so it's the same. So there's a bunch of similar things listed out here and you can try it out. And the etcd certificate. So etcd uses certificates for all kinds of communications between the etcd members, between the server client, and be between um, also for authenticating the request, client request. So it is actually located in the etcd Kubernetes PKI, PKI etcd folder. Let's go ahead and just list those certificates out. So we can see a bunch of um, the issuing the CSR tier and then like peer and the server. Here if we go and CAD the um, health check client certificate and check the validity for it. So we can see that it is listed for about in here. The validity is about in here. So this is mostly educational. So if you are already using any tool, uh, it will by default provision the leaf and intermediary for about one year. This is just to see how you can um, check um, on your own if you're interested. And um, that's it in this um, session. I do, so yeah, I do want to add. Uh, so I've, I've, I've worked with many end users, and I have seen many clusters have expired but, certs, so, yeah. and that stops the functionality of Kubernetes. Uh, so you should be aware of when your certs expire. Uh, and as Sabita mentioned, when you upgrade Kubernetes, it will rotate Definitely. your certs as well. So uh, folks should also upgrade Kubernetes CoreLink. There's uh, lots of updates and CD patches uh, with Kubernetes. So when they do upgrade to Kubernetes, uh, it does rotate their, the certs as well. And also that we have three releases per year, yep. and at any given point of time, only like uh, th three versions are supported, three, right, Rick? Yes. The current and the uh, three versions are supported. Yeah. So it is almost like an year. So if you are keeping up with your upgrade cycle, you're automatically rotating your certificates. And if you are using the managed service provider, they take care of that for you when you upgrade your cluster. There was also an interesting discussion on um, one of the um, Cubadium that I saw, like someone had asked for the extension of CSR for like 100 years or so. You know, but um, you can have, like if you are gonna have 100 years of expiration for a CSR, but you're not gonna up upgrade your Kubernetes, you're gonna run into a lot of uh, security issues. And there would be no patches for the versions that are not supported anymore. Um, yeah, that is a little thing that I learned today. Um, any questions on this? OK, moving on. All right. So the last module is on uh, pod placements. So uh, when you do have applications running in pods, uh, and if there are sensitive uh, applications and you want to isolate them on nodes or specific nodes, uh, we can use taints on those nodes uh, so that will prevent any new pods uh, running on those nodes. And we could use, and if you do want uh, those sensitive applications running on those isolated nodes, on those tainted nodes, you use a toleration, and that toleration should match the taint in order for the application uh, to run on that isolated node or that tainted node. Uh, and we'll also look into how we place pods uh, using the node selector. So in case if you have uh, pods that need to run on specific, on specific nodes with, uh, with access to, to, specific, to specific hardware, uh, like GPUs, uh, you could use a node selector. 
or maybe a node has a, a certain security guard we all set up for that node, you could use a node selector. So since AI is big in Kubernetes right now, there is a feature called the node feature discovery. It's, uh, external, to, it's external to the Kubernetes project, but uh, folks use the node feature discovery to see and find what hardware is attached to those nodes. And the node feature discovery applies a label on those nodes. And pods that need access to, to that hardware can use a node selector uh, on that node, that node feature discovery applied to that node. And also another uh, use case or to use to make sure that we're using pod placement uh, is, is still in the principle of zero trust. Uh, to make sure that we we'll always assume that there will be a breach uh, and to minimize the blast radius. Uh, so we want to make sure uh, if, you, if there is a breach in, your, in, your, in a container, you want to make sure it's not running alongside on the same node that is running on the control plane of your Kubernetes cluster. So we'll look at node selectors, taint, and tolerations in this module. So let's take a look uh, at our cluster itself. So we have three nodes, one control plane, and two worker nodes, as we expect. We're going to create a new uh, namespace to uh, create our pods in, the pod placement namespace. Uh, we'll create a daemon set. Uh, so daemon set is used in cases where we want a pod a uh, to run on every node in the cluster. So this is used for like log collection, uh, storage, or monitoring. So we'll create a daemon set here, just using Nginx, uh, and we're just, this is the pod template, so this is just pretty basic, just using Nginx and exposing port 80. So we have a daemon set uh, created, so uh, what do we expect? We should uh, expect this pod, or a pod, a copy of the pod from this daemon set to run on uh, every node in the cluster. So let's take a look. Of course, uh, we only see them running on the worker nodes, so we only see two pods running. Uh, in the cluster, and we could take a look at why, of course. And uh, like I mentioned, taints allow a node to repel pods, uh, and while the toleration allows those pods to, uh, to be scheduled with those matching taints. Uh, and we could imperially uh, do, use a command, the keep control taint, to actually taint uh, a, a node, and it, there's a format of key equals value. It does not need a value, and the effect. And we'll take a look at what is used and what the possible effects uh, are. So we're going to just use a key control command here to keep control get nodes. Use the custom columns uh, to see uh, there is a, a taints in the in the spec of the nodes, so we could take a look at them, uh, see what the uh, effects are. Uh, and see what the taint key is. And uh, if there's value, there is no, no value for this one, so I didn't add it in here. So we do see the taint on the control plane node, uh, and so that's why the daemon set was not, is not running on the control plane node. So the taint is uh, no schedule. Uh, so uh, no schedule means that's not going to affect any running nodes currently when that taint was affected on that, on that node. Uh, and it's going to, uh, the taint is the key node role uh, kubernetes.io slash control plane. And there's other three total effects as well. Uh, so the no executes, if this was no executes, and that means if there were any running pods in this, uh, in this node, then it will actually evict those running pods unless they had a matching toleration. Uh, so in this one, with no schedule, it doesn't affect running pods, only uh, new pods. And prefer not uh, no schedule, meaning that there's a preference, so it does, it's just a soft version of no schedule. Uh, so if there's no other place to place the, plot, the pod, it will actually place it there. And kind, as we see here, defaults to taint the control plane node. Uh, kubeadm does the same as well. So if you start a kubeadm cluster from upstream, it will also taint the control plane node as well, because we don't want uh, any application uh, to be running on the same uh, node that our control plane is running in case there is a container escape uh, from the application and they have access to the uh, Kubernetes control plane components. So we're going to delete uh, this daemon set here. Uh, and let's actually use, um, uh, let's actually deploy a daemon set that actually tolerates the taint on the control plane node. This is typically a big no-no, but this is just to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to show how we can use a toleration uh, uh, on this daemon set or in this pod for this daemon set here. 
So we see that here in this in the spec field here and under tolerations, uh, it matches that same key that we see in the tank key here, uh, node-role.kubernetes.io slash control plane. Uh, and it just, we wanna make sure it just, it just exists and the effect is mat has to match as well, no schedule. So let's take a look to see if this statement set is actually running now on all three nodes. And since we have the toleration, we do expect it and we do see it uh, running in all three nodes here. So let's delete that daemon sets. Uh, so now, because we're not supposed to be running applications, uh, other applications on the control plane node. So now we're gonna look into a, a node selector uh, and we could use node selector to make sure pods are placed on specific nodes or group of nodes since we're using labels. Uh, and labels are a way to identify and group things like nodes or pods or other Kubernetes objects here. So we're gonna look at uh, node labels, since the, labels, the, the, the node selector uses labels. We'll see the existing labels uh, on the nodes here. Uh, and labels are often used for, uh, we could identify the architecture. Uh, we could do the, the, the type of, of OS as well. We have see Linux here, uh, the host name as well. And there are other things like node feature discovery that will actually add labels to tell, uh, to tell the user or the cluster what hardware is accessible on that node as well. So now we're gonna add a label, uh, two labels here. We're gonna label one of the workers uh, security equals low, because a label is a key value pair. So we're gonna say the first worker node it has low security, and we're gonna say the, the second node, uh, the sec second worker node has high security. And the labels do not prevent pods from being scheduled on nodes. It's just, uh, it just used to identify and group nodes. So let's just confirm the labels are created with uh, keep control get nodes dash dash show dash labels. And we see those labels here in the very bottom. And we're going to assign, let's say, a, a pod that we deem high security. So it should be running on a node that has certain guardrails uh, that we deem has high security as well. So here we have a, a pod manifest here, uh, and we have a node selector. Uh, which, uh, which under node selector has a key value pair, sec security equals high. So with this with node selector here, we expect it to run uh, only on the second worker node where we have the matching label, uh, security equals high. And so let's, uh, since that pod is created, let's go take a look and get, uh, check where that pod is placed. And it looks like it's correct here, it's on worker node two here, so we do expect uh, where we do have that pod running here. Uh, and let me see here, did that check, and we're gonna do a little cleanup here. Uh, we can, we'll delete the pod and delete the, the namespace as well. And just to summarize here, um, always have the concept of zero trust. Uh, uh, whenever you are creating pods or replacing pods, you wanna minimize that blast radius. Uh, always assume that there will be a, a container escape uh, so you want to make sure that the, uh, the high, uh, highly sensitive applications are, are either isolated on nodes or, or, other, or other pods are not uh, scheduled on the same node as those uh, highly sensitive applications. So. All right. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining. I hope you learned a few things uh, following this workshop. And... Uh, I wanted to say a little thanks to Isovalent for providing the instruct like uh, infrastructure. And uh, again, like the, the workshop will not, you, you will not be able to like retake this workshop specifically on instruct, but you can use the repository that is like at the bottom of the little uh, page we distributed to replay those uh, things locally on your cluster. So yeah. And the repository is not public. So uh, thank you very much for your thank time. You. Thank you for attending. Thank you.